G'day, it's Rob from ECT for Health. Thanks for being with us for another one of our Knowing Your Jargons, or KYJs as we have come to call them. Uh, in this video we're going to be having a look at some of those equations. You probably learned about them once upon a time, but what we're really trying to do is just to refresh your memory on some of those classic medical equations that, uh, that pepper our, uh, uh, our clinical experience. I'd like to have a look in today's short little video on mean arterial pressure uh, and its equation. I'd like to have a look at pulse pressure. I'd like to have a look at cerebral perfusion pressure. And I'd also like to have a little bit of a look at cardiac output. We'll do a bit more on cardiac output in another one of our episodes where we actually have a look at this concept called the Frank Starling Principle. But just to start with, let's start with mean arterial pressure. To understand the difference between mean arterial pressure and its sort of its grandfather, I suppose, blood pressure, what we must understand is that blood pressure is, as you know from taking blood pressures, is two values. It's a systolic blood pressure value over a diastolic blood pressure value. And a very simplified way of determining the difference between those two is that the top number is often, well, is always bigger than the bottom number, and the top number represents the, the peak pressure that the heart is using to pump a wave of blood through your uh, peripheral arterial network. We, we generally take our blood pressure on the brachial artery of our arms, although that's not the only place that blood pressure can be taken clinically. But importantly, somewhere between these two numbers, the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure, exists the mean, or the average. And the reason that we use our mean arterial pressure in some areas of clinical practice, and not all areas of clinical practice, is predominantly because mean arterial pressure is that part of our blood pressure that clinicians will use to determine the, the organ perfusion pressure. So if I want to know what somebody's overall blood pressure is, I'm going to take their BP, just like you would clinically when we do vital signs. But if I want to understand how well the vital organs are being perfused, how well perfused the heart is, the brain, the kidneys are, the vital organs, then using our blood pressure, we can calculate a mean arterial pressure and determine whether the mean arterial pressure is adequate or not. Now many texts have differing opinions on what is considered in an adult to be a normal or an average or an adequate mean arterial pressure. We're going to be speaking fairly much from all of the literature and it tends to indicate that a normal mean arterial pressure for, uh, for most adults is between 60 and 70 millimetres of mercury. Let's not put the cart before the horse though. We're going to write down that 60 to 70 millimetres of mercury. We'll average that at 65. We're going to call that our magic number. This is the number of mean arterial pressure with which we need to keep our mean arterial pressure at 65 or above to ensure that we're perfusing heart, brain, lungs and kidneys. If our mean arterial pressure should drop as a consequence of our blood pressure dropping, if our mean arterial pressure drops below 65, then it would be reasonable to assume that the brain is not getting the blood supply that it requires for normal healthy function, nor are the kidneys, neither is the heart or the lungs. And so you can appreciate that a dramatic drop in blood pressure would equal a dramatic drop in mean arterial pressure, which would therefore equal the demise or a deterioration of the patient because vital organs aren't being perfused with their nutrients and oxygen that's required. So let's have a look at the calculation. To start with, let's understand that blood pressure is a reflection of the systolic blood pressure over the top of the diastolic. And if we could use a, an, an average blood pressure for most adults, I think most of you would be comfortable with the, the fact that if a person had a blood pressure of 120 on 80, uh, it's kind of the archetypical textbook normal blood pressure for, for most uh, normal adults. Then we have there our systolic and our diastolic. 
Now, between these two numbers, if I was to take my systolic value, which is the 120, and my diastolic value, which is the 80, and I was to subtract the diastolic from that systolic value, what I'd have is what's referred to as the pulse pressure. And so in this instance, if I took 120 and I subtracted 80 from that, I would have a pulse pressure, which in this example, equals 40 millimetres of mercury. So these values are always in millimetres of mercury. It's a standard pressure reading that we use in medicine. So we know that we've got a patient with a BP of 120 on 80, and that gives us therefore a pulse pressure of 40. Let's have a look at the calculation of the mean. The mean arterial pressure equals one third of that pulse pressure, which we determined was 40, plus the patient's diastolic blood pressure. So if we took that patient's pulse pressure at 40 and we divided that by a third, then we would essentially be saying 40 over 3 plus diastolic is going to give me roughly 13 plus some change, so it's about 13.3 recurring if you wanted to plug that into a calculator, plus the diastolic which we determined previously was 80. My mean arterial pressure therefore for a patient with a BP of 120 on 80 would be 93. 0.3 recurring. At 93 millimetres of mercury, somebody's mean arterial pressure is high enough, is adequate enough to be perfusing brain, heart, kidneys, lungs, and we would expect that there would be enough perfusion and enough oxygenation of this patient if this mean arterial pressure was at that value. But let's have a look at an example of somebody who is profoundly hypotensive somebody with a low blood pressure. It might be somebody that's had a, a, a motor vehicle accident, some sort of a trauma, uh, a, a catastrophe where they've lost a lot of blood. And it's reasonable to assume that when I've lost a certain volume of my blood, then I'm going to start to see uh, not only the classic tachycardia that you would see in a trauma patient who's lost blood, but you'd also start to see that blood pressure start to plummet. It's a reasonably late sign in shock that blood pressure should drop. But let's assume that a person has had a significant blood loss and now they're starting to demonstrate that through a loss of blood pressure. We'll take this, uh, this patient, assume that this patient may have had, uh, say, a, a pelvic fracture. It's not uncommon to, to lose three litres of blood from a, from a fractured pelvis. It's not uncommon, therefore, for somebody to come in with quite a catastrophically low blood pressure. Let's call it 80 on 40. It's reasonable that you'd be looking at this blood pressure and if you've been in clinical practice for some time, you'd be looking at that BP and you'd be going, yuck, that's not a number you really want to write down on an ob sheet. But at the end of the day, let's have a look at what the mean arterial pressure is calculated out for this particular patient. Remembering that our mean arterial pressure is one third of the pulse pressure plus diastolic Let's first calculate pulse pressure. Again, we would take 80 systolic and we would subtract from it the diastolic of 40. So we would take 80 minus 40. My pulse pressure is therefore 40. I'm going to take one third of my pulse pressure to calculate this. I'm going to go with one third of 40. So the equation is 40 over three or we knew from the last exercise, about 13 plus change. We're going to add that to the diastolic of 40, and this gives us a mean arterial pressure of just a little over 53. And you'll recall that our magic number was 65. That's our target. To be able to continue normal brain function, to be able to continue normal cardiac function, normal kidney function and normal lung function, vital organ function, we need a pressure of 65 circulating through those end organs. When this patient's had a large blood loss, 
or a large loss of blood during surgery and therefore has a, reduced, a reduced blood pressure, it's, it's reasonable that we can see that this patient's going to be hypoperfused. Now if I'm not sending as much blood as I should be through somebody's brain, it makes sense that we're going to see all of those symptoms of an altered level of consciousness, agitation, confusion and restlessness in somebody who's in a hypovolemic shock. It also makes sense that if somebody is not going to be perfusing enough blood through their kidneys, they're not putting enough perfusion pressure, mean arterial pressure through their kidneys, then it's reasonable to assume that that patient who has that large loss of blood, by, by virtue of the fact that they're not driving pressure through their kidneys, they're going to have a reduced urine output. And in a trauma or a post-operative patient with an IDC, and we're measuring their urine output, it's reasonable because they don't have great perfusion pressure, mean arterial pressure, it's reasonable to see that they would have a reduced urine output. We're going to see poor cardiac function. They may be experiencing breathlessness. They may be experiencing tachycardia, and they certainly are going to be potentially experiencing some sort of ischemia to that patient's heart, to their heart muscle, as a result of simply not perfusing the heart with the amount of pressure that's required to maintain normal function. So that's our first little one. We looked at mean arterial pressure. The importance of recognising the difference between it and a standard blood pressure is that mean arterial pressure looks at our organ perfusion. It's generally used in critical care areas and we would target fluid resuscitate or target medication manage our patients who are in shock to target their mean arterial pressure at or slightly around or above that 65 mark, particularly if it was diminished as in the case of this patient. Mean arterial pressure. That helps to know your jargon. <laughs>